Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I was saying that um, I've been given a guide to follow for my presentation, but inshallah, if there are questions afterwards, there will be time. Um, so the first question is um, about my family background. So for those of you who, and actually I should first preface by saying my four youngest children are here with me today, and one of the reasons why I thought this was a great idea to do because um, I have two teenagers, and there are so few joys in um, having teenagers, but one of them is to embarrass them. So alhamdulillah, I'm sure they're going to be very embarrassed this evening. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, I happen to have a very ethnic name. So Moira McGuire is a very Irish name, although there are people who will be like, oh, Moira, is that Greek or is that French? Um, it's very Irish, and I was raised, um, both my parents are Irish Americans. There were four of us. My mom had four kids in four and a half years, so we were all very close in age. Um, and we were also raised very Catholic, um, because you can't be Irish and not Catholic. So <laughs> there was um, a lot of religion in my house. There wasn't a lot of politics directly, but it was kind of an indirect message. Um, there were certain things that you never did. You didn't get divorced. Um, and uh, you were never anything other than Catholic. That was it. So we went to all Catholic schools. Um, my dad taught at Catholic University for almost 50 years. He went there. That's where he met my mom. Um, my mom teaches there. My sister teaches there. You know, went to Catholic elementary school, went to Catholic high school, went to Catholic college. <laughs> so, um, so very, very Catholic. And I, I loved my upbringing. I really did. I didn't have, <clears throat> um, I'm not the type of person who accepts Islam and then kind of trashes where I came from because it, it wasn't a matter of hating it. I just think that probably by the time I was in my um, teenage years, I just, I kind of felt as though there was something more. I wasn't really sure what it was, but I just, felt like there was something more. And, um, and oftentimes, the way things were presented to us, um, so you know, as Catholics, here's what we believe, and you just have to believe it. Doesn't necessarily have to make sense. Um, and and I, you know, I didn't like that. I remember the priest used to come in. And when the priest would come in, everybody would stand up. I mean, it was a sign of respect. Everybody would stand up out of their chairs. You didn't do that with the nuns, but when the priest came in, you better stand up. Um, and they would talk about how important it was to treat your body well and, you know, that it's God's temple. And then, you know, you'd see them out smoking in the parking lot and, you know, drinking. And, um, and they never had a good answer other than, you know, just, just accept it. Or, or the Trinity, you know, just never really, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but that math never, like, kind of added up for me. So, but alhamdulillah, it was, so when I was in college, I started my exploration of other faiths. And I looked at a lot of them. Um, and none of them were, I mean, there were certain aspects in all of them that I found kind of attractive, but none of them was really speaking to me. So <clears throat> I just thought, OK, that's it. I'm just meant to be a Catholic. I wasn't going to church. Um, hadn't been to church in a while. But if we were in a room like this, and everybody said, OK, all the Catholics stand up and go over there. I would have stood up and gone over there. Um, and then I, um, I started working at a hotel downtown. And I had a coworker from the Ivory Coast who was Muslim. And, um, and he would talk to me about it you know, from time to time, because he'd go off places and pray. And, um, and you know, through my college course, I'd already learned a little bit about Islam. And, um, and I was at the hotel for a number of years, because I worked there while I was in nursing school. And, uh, they can't hear? Oh, oh, sorry. Wow. I've never been told I was too quiet. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, I was at the hotel for a number of years going through nursing school. And uh, <clears throat> I, one of the corpsmen who worked there, one of the corpsmen, one of the bellmen who worked there, um, you know, we just kind of struck up a conversation and started talking. And, um, and that was 21 years ago. Um, and we ended up getting married, and uh, and he. So my this was my husband, and he's Ethiopian, <clears throat> and he 
And so when he asked me to marry him, I was like, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he said, well, you know, it's really important that the kids are raised Muslim. And I was like, I'm so cool with that because I really, you know, there are a lot of things that I admired about it. And I've never been much of a gambling woman, so I thought, okay, if you're praying five times a day and you can't get it right, like you're, <laughs> you're in trouble. So I thought, no, this is a great, it's a great way to raise kids. But it was definitely his thing, it wasn't mine. I was like, I'm cool, we'll raise the kids Muslim. And, um, and so we did that for a while. And uh, so Zakaria, our oldest, I had two kids. Um, so Zakaria was my third, my husband's first. And, um, and we decided that we wanted to send him to school, just part time so he could learn some Quran and, um, and hang out with other kids. So we sent him to Al Huda. And, uh, and that's, I think, where I started to get a lot of exposure to the sisters. And, and you know, when I would go over there, I'd always cover, because it was just, in my mind, the respectful thing to do. Like, you don't go into somebody's house and, you know, don't behave appropriately. So, um, so I'd go over there. And, and I think, you know, looking back, there were a lot of sisters who, because I covered, just assumed that I was Muslim. And, um, and I remember <laughs> one sister in particular a few years before I took my shahada, somebody said to her, well, you know, Sister Moyer is not Muslim. And she was like, astaghfirullah, can you say such a thing? But, you know, so I, you know, I got a lot of information. I got a lot of exposure. And, um, but, but again, you know, I've met a lot of people who have converted, reverted, who <clears throat> it's a very short and simple process. You know, they read the Quran, they, you know, meet, they meet somebody, um, and boom, they're taking their shahada. I would like to say mine was quick. So let's see, my husband and I have been together 21 years, and I took my shahada eight years ago. So, <laughs> so for 13 years, that man very patiently waited <laughs> for me to see the light. Um, and uh, so, subhanAllah. So, you know, I guess the first time I heard about um, Islam was in college, but you know, it's really, it was a number of years, a number of experiences. Um, so when I took my Shahada, I was 30, 36. And, uh, and I remember some of the sisters had a party. They were so excited. They'd been waiting for this for a very long time. And they were like, oh, you know, this is your first like real salah. Come on, we're gonna have you lead it. And I was like, have me lead it? I don't even know what I'm, I'm gonna have everybody moonwalking. You do not want me leading this salah, trust me. <laughs> I really don't know what I'm doing. Um, so um, what or who encouraged or influenced me, me to become Muslim? I, I will tell you that we were at Al Huda, and we've been there since 1999, so it was, We've been there a long time. And when we first would go, it was for my husband to pray. So I'd sit in the car while he ran in you know, for his salah. And I'd see all the you know, sisters go by. And they looked so exotic and so mysterious. And, um, and then when we started taking Zechariah to school, then I was out walking around. And, um, and there were definitely some um, you know, just kind of um, events that happened that maybe weren't very positive. You know, some sister would just kind of like brush past you in the hall and like bump into you and not say anything. And, um, and at that time, I think because I was just struggling, like it really, you know, <clears throat> you'd meet an amazing person and it'd be one step. And you'd have like a negative experience and it seemed to be like 10 steps in reverse, you know. Um, again, not really equal math, but it didn't, it didn't have to make sense. It's just kind of how it was for a long time. And, and even my approach to Islam, it was very cerebral. It was very intellectual. Wow, this is lovely. This is really nice. Wow, this is fascinating. Um, and I remember being in the hall one time. I think it was during Ramadan for Tarawih. And um, one of the brothers was reciting Quran, and he was crying. And I remember it, it really, sorry, I swore I wasn't going to do it. <laughs> anyway, it really touched me, I think, in a way that I didn't anticipate. Um, but there was something about, you know, I thought to myself, what? here's a grown man. You know, this isn't a six-year-old. This is a grown man 
who's reading something. I'm not really sure what it is. I don't know what he's saying. But I mean, he is close to sobbing. And um, it, was, it was amazing. So it did. It took, um, it took 13 years of uh, lots of wonderful experiences. Um, but I, I finally got there. And, uh, and I will say that my husband was a critical part of it, because he really is an amazingly, huh? Oh. <laughs> he is an amazingly um, patient person. You know, 13 years waiting and hoping, the whole time having to accept the fact that maybe she would never take her shahada, and having to be, you know, alhamdulillah, okay with that, and he was. So I have um, undying respect and uh, gratitude for my husband. Um, so what was my family's reaction to my conversion? I think um, for most of my family members, because again, my husband and I had been married for such a long time, they were like, uh, it's about time. What were you waiting for? I mean, I think they thought I was going to do it a long, you know, a lot sooner. Um, you know, when I called my mom, because before I had a girlfriend who had taken her shahada a few years earlier, and she didn't tell anybody um, before she did it. And I thought to myself, okay, well, I don't want to do it that way. I want people to know before I do it. So I made sure I called like my older daughter and my mom and my sister, and you know. And so when I called my mom and told her, I got this on the other end of the phone. <laughs> like silence for a really long time. And I was like, Mom? <laughs> and then she said, you know, we all have our own journey to take and our own path. <laughs> I was like, OK, so that means you're pleased. <laughs> um, and again, I think that Looking back, um, you know, culture is an amazingly powerful thing. And I think it's powerful in ways that we don't even appreciate or understand. But, um, and even when I look at my friends who took their shahada um, in a, I guess what you would say, a timely or a quick manner, oftentimes, um, they weren't necessarily raised with a very strong religious identity. Um, or if they were, it wasn't a religious identity that was wrapped up in like, you know, their ethnicity as well. And, um, and, and you almost have to uh, reinvent yourself to a certain extent. Like you really have to take everything apart that you learned um, and examine it. And it's, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work and I can see even as I talk to you know family members and friends, that it, it's the kind of work that you know not everybody can do. They just you you can see them struggling with it, and they're not going to be able to do it. Um, I used to describe myself as a tightly sealed jar, um, and you know everybody would come along. So every time I had a positive experience, it was like somebody was just kind of loosening that jar a little bit. But I mean, it took a lot of like turns at the jar <laughs> to get that top popped open. Um, and I guess there are some jars that there aren't enough hands and not enough turns. Um, so all in all, I think, you know, the men in my family were kind of like, oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, congratulations. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, and uh, I did have a coworker who was um, very angry, um, very angry. And you know, we still work very closely together, and we've kind of agreed to disagree on you know the whole religion thing. But other than that, I don't think anybody, um, you know, nobody was negative. They were, you know. Although I will say, there were a number of people because this was in, <clears throat> excuse me, this was in 2003. So it was um, a little less than two years after 9-11. So a lot of people were curious as to my timing. So they didn't necessarily want to, they didn't want to know why, but they wanted to know why now. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, like, wow, if you came to this realization in your life, why would you want to put it off? Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, have any of my family members taken their shahada? Uh, no, they have not. And um, I don't know, Allahu alam, we, uh, 
Oh, thanks. Uh, hopefully I won't need it anymore, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, my parents are older and they've, you know, they've had this identity for a very long time and um, so, you know, we just, we try to live our lives in a very um, meaningful um, way that, that shows people the beauty of Islam and, and we just make dua, we just make dua. Um, so the next question is, do I feel the Muslim community adequately embraced and supported me during my transition to Islam? You know, it's interesting because again, I had been such a part of the community for such a long time that um, when it happened, everybody was like, woohoo, great, okay, see you later. You know, because I think they just, there was this assumption that I've, that I'd been a part of it for such a long time that I probably picked up so much stuff that I was, you know, she's good to go. Um, and, and again, I, I think so much of what I've learned has been through relationships. And I, and I love the idea of having mentors, but, you know, mentors really um, need to be not the type of mentor who feels as though they're about to accomplish a task, but a mentor who understands that <clears throat> he or she is about to enter into a relationship. Because the relationship is really where you, you learn. Um, you know, we, we started a homeschool group, and, um, and subhanAllah, you know, they probably didn't realize it at the time, but all the sisters in the homeschool group, I mean, they were, they were educating me along the way. Like, <laughs> you know, they just, they may not have been aware of it, and may Allah bless all of them, because they're amazing sisters, but that's really how, um, you know, how you bring people along, because it's, for many people, it is a completely new identity. I mean, you have to think about it. You have to learn like what foot to put in what shoe first. I mean, you know, you're almost going back to the beginning on a, on on some levels. It's there's a lot to learn, um, and so I think for me, it's really about relationships. You know, developing relationships. Um, so, what advice would I offer to people considering converting to Islam? Mm. Wow, what advice would I offer? Well, I will tell you one thing that I struggled with a little bit because um, in Catholicism, you are taught that you can tell a lot about a religion by the people who practice it. Um, and so I kind of came to the Muslim community with that idea, um, that if you meet wonderful, amazing people, then this is clearly a valuable you know, religion. Um, and if the people behave badly, then it's not. Um, and you really can't look at it that way, you know? I mean, we're, we're all a work in progress and we're, we're all struggling um, to do our best, but we're not perfect, you know? I mean, the dean is, but we're not, and so you really can't, you have to separate the two. You have to be really um, prepared to separate the two. Um, I don't know. I don't know what else, what other advice I would give. But that, that was probably the biggest thing that I struggled, that I struggled with. Um, and then, you know, you always get tripped up on like one or two verses in the Quran, you know, because you're like, mm, I don't think so, you know. Or <laughs> um, so again, I mean, you know, I could have 50 positive experiences. Like, and, and honestly, when I first read the Quran, you know, it's so unlike the Bible. Um, although Catholics aren't really big Bible readers. Um, <clears throat> like you hear the Bible at, you know, Sunday Mass. Um, and actually Sunday Mass is pretty much how you set your watch because it is 60 minutes. I'm telling you right now, it is <laughs> timed perfectly. And, um, but you know, you don't really read the Bible at any other time during the week. It's pretty much a Sunday thing. So when I read the Quran for the first time, it was, it was just a different format. It was very unusual and I wasn't accustomed to it. And then um, I, you know, every time I hear, because I haven't stopped hearing about people's experiences where they opened Quran and read it the first time and subhanAllah, that was it, they knew. And, and I, I always was kind of secretly jealous of that, thinking, wow, I didn't have that experience at all. <laughs> at all. Um, 
but uh, anyway, so so that is um, that's the end of my guide. I guess we can take questions. Are there any questions? Do we have another microphone there? Okay. Well, we need somebody to to be the runner. Uh, do, does anybody has any question? Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Alaikum salam. Question is about your parents. Have you uh, uh, give them dawa for? Did you? <laughs> Try to give them dawa for Islam for your parents or your family, or how you what your relations now with them if they are Christian. Mashallah, I have a wonderful relationship with both my parents. They are amazing parents. I give them dawa every time I possibly can. Um, you know, my mom is uh, 76. My dad is 85, um, and. I, you know, it's not for lack of trying, I will tell you that, but, <clears throat> um, you know, they've, they've been in this role for a very long time. Um, and, and I know a lot of people don't understand, um, like, the, the, the political and religious aspect of being Irish and Catholic, but it is a powerful thing. It is a vow, I mean, you know, the English oppressed the Irish for 800 years. Um, and so even though there's been some sort of like um, agreement on the island of how things are gonna be divided up, don't think for a second that that hasn't stopped. And it stopped, and, and I mean, it continues to the extent that, like, you know, my grandmother's from Canada. You know, I think that my mom is like first generation here on one side, third generation on another side. My dad's like second generation on both sides. I mean, it's almost like passed on through the blood. Um, but Allahu Alam, I mean, if you know, if it's going to happen, it will happen. But we do have a wonderful relationship with both of them. So, Salam alaikum, sister. Uh, this is uh, Imam Ahmad Zara, the Imam of the Masjid. First of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to come to and be a speaker tonight. And thank you for It's asking. really a great opportunity. Thank you. And I enjoyed your talking about your journey to Islam. Yeah, sure. But my question to you may be uh, a little different, maybe looked at as bizarre question. I think uh, nobody has asked this question before. But this question, um, comes to me all the time because I'm dealing with the people who convert to accept Islam and come to my office and then they ask for mentorship and how, how to be on the track all the time, especially that they uh, came from a different background, different culture, as you mentioned about your struggle with your uh, co-workers or your family or whatever. So what's my, my question simply, what is the thing that uh, may let a person who accepted Islam and became committed to Islam to leave Islam. So someone who became committed and accepted Islam and converted and without any kind of pressure, but he loves Islam and he realized that Islam is the true way. What, what's the thing that may happen to him or her in, in, in his life or her life that may drive them away from Islam or to leave Islam? Because this, this thing happened to me many times from sisters or brothers who may have something that take them away from Islam again. So what's this thing in your mind? Thank you. Okay, so that is, um, I wouldn't say bizarre, but that's a complex question. I will say that for me personally, um, you know, if I accepted Islam because my husband is amazing, and honestly, I think if all brothers were like my husband, the entire world would be Muslim, but um, then I would have converted like the day after we got married. You know, one reason why it took me 13 years um, is because, partially because of my identity, but I think once I really realized that this was um, 
you know, the right way to lead your life, then I really, um, I did not want to take my shahada and then become like a hypocrite and not be able to really do it the way it's supposed to be done. Because it is, it's a significant commitment and, um, and work when you're not brought up that way. Um, and, and so what would take someone away from Islam, um, I would not, um, I would not be able to begin to answer. Um, however, I think that whenever we're in um, a position that makes us uncomfortable, we revert back to what we know and what's familiar. Um, and so, you know, as they're transitioning and encountering obstacles, if they don't have someone there who's kind of helping them to problem solve it, you know, within this new frame of reference, then they're going to go back to what, what they knew. Um, and so that's why I think, again, the importance of, of relationships. You know, you can't just say, okay, I'm a mentor, so my responsibility is to, uh, do you have a copy of Quran? Check. Have you signed up for the Muslim 101 class? Check. You know, do you have my phone number? You can call me once a month. Check. Like, you know, it can't be um, a task-oriented um, mentorship. It really needs to be, you know, we're now entering into a relationship, and I'm going to be you know, at your beck and call and by your side for the next year, two years, three years, however long it takes. Um, so. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Shala, I wanted to ask a question about the types of uh, people that you may have come across in terms of the person that you thought was teaching you the deen of Islam, but then as you got a better understanding of Islam and then went back to that individual that taught you the wrong way, was there ever a time that you approached that individual and say, listen, the stuff that you taught me in the beginning of my journey was incorrect, but I've learned this, uh, how come did you taught me the wrong way. I'm not sure if I'm uh, asking the question the right way, but I hope, I hope it's, it's clear enough for you to be able to answer. And if not, you can ask me again and I'll see if I can reword it. Okay, so um, were there times when people gave me information that may have been incorrect? Possibly. Um, I think that, you know, by nature, I am a company gal. You know, I'm not the type of person who's going to rock the boat, stir the pot, <laughs> push the envelope, per se. But I also approach everything with a very healthy dose of, um, I wouldn't say skepticism, but, and, and again, I think it's one of, the benefits. There are, there are many drawbacks to not being raised Muslim. So, you know, learning Arabic, that's a challenge. <laughs> you know, if you, you know, grew up learning Arabic, mashallah, I mean, you are. That's a nice thing. It's a very nice thing. Um, but I will say that coming from a culture that was not wrapped up um, in an Islamic identity, I think helped me to kind of question things like, okay, are what you're, you know, is what you're teaching me culture or religion? And I think even from the beginning, I always approached it in that manner. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I mean, I remember my husband and I had a lengthy conversation one time about pants. You know, we well, can't wear pants. Well, what do you mean you can't wear pants? We just can't wear pants. Okay, well, why can't you wear pants? Um, well, because then, you know, people will see, you know, that you have legs. Okay, well, I'm assuming they already know that I have legs. I mean, like, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, like the sisters who wear the shower kameez. I mean, those are pants. Well, but they're different kinds of pants. You know, it, so, so these kinds of conversations. Um, and I'm sure, again, because my husband has amazing patience that he kind of put up with it. But, um, and I think for me, um, 
you know, we're all, again, a work in progress. I have seen myself, you know, move along my path. I've seen other people move along the path. Um, and and I, I like to think that no one has given me information um, that was wrong with the intention of doing that. Um, and so because of that, I, I don't think I've ever gone back to anyone. Um, now, I will say, you know, since you bring it up, and I don't know if this is what you, you might be referring to, but um, when I first took my shahada, there were people who would say, okay, well, now this is what you need to do. Uh, and this is the way we do it. Um, and so, like, the whole four schools of thought, and, like, you know, nobody ever approached it like, okay, so there are four accepted schools, um, and my own personal choice is this one, but there are three other opinions. Nobody ever says that. They kind of... Um, or at least the people I encountered, they made their own personal decisions, and then they passed on their own personal decisions as though they should be everybody else's own personal decisions. Um, and, I, and again, you know, because I kind of question everything before I accept it, I, I think I was pretty good about trying to figure out what was someone's, you know, personal decision versus you know, what's accepted amongst all four, or, you know, what my options were in terms of how I decided to, you know, interpret or understand or practice or accept. Um, but I think people coming, you know, um, because I'll tell you, you know, whenever somebody takes their shahada, everybody wants to be around that person. It's like they've got this good energy, you know, you want to rub up and down on their arm, and you want to get those good vibes. Um, and then it comes, the, well, you need to do this. You need to do that, um, and and it is. It's very overwhelming. It's very. You go from this incredible high. I mean, I remember when I first took my shahada. I felt like I weighed two pounds. Like if I didn't, you know, weigh my ankles down, that I would have floated up into space. It was amazing. And I remember telling my sister that I'm like, oh my God, Margaret, this is the most amazing feeling in the world. I said, you know what? Do you understand that I am now sin free? And she's like, oh my God, that's horrible. I said, what are you talking about? Horrible, this is amazing. She's like, no, no, no. She said, that's like getting a new car. Like you're constantly worried about when you're going to get that first ping or that first dent in the car. <laughs> I was like, it's okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say that my car is dent free. It is not. <laughs> I've pinged it and dented it in the eight years, but... Um, anyway, so I don't know if I answered your question, but inshallah, I, I did a little. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, but you said you have a lot of positive and negative yeah. uh, You said you had a lot of positive and negative experiences during those 13 years. Could you share some of them so that we could just learn what we do right and what we do wrong when we're dealing with people who are asking about Islam or interested in Islam? Okay, so... Hmm. <laughs> um, well, again, I mean, when we first got, when we first started going to Al-Huda, there were, um, you know, Again, because, you know, just culturally, people have different sensitivities, you know? Um, and so when I was raised, you know, there was, my grandmother was a big person on being a lady. There were certain things that ladies did and did not do. Um, and so I remember the first time a sister came barreling down the hall and, like, Zach was walking with me and she almost knocked me over and didn't say a word. And I was like... I was looking for, like, you know, the manners police or something. Like, um, did you see that? I, it, it shocked me. Or the first time I was in the sook, and, um, and, you know, everybody's waiting in line, and here come a few brothers thinking that, you know, clearly they hold a position that I'm not aware of, but they seem to think that it entitled them to go to the front of the line. Um, and, you know, I, I try to be a patient person, but I remember the first time I spoke up and everybody's looking at me like I had three eyeballs. But I was like, uh, brother, we're all waiting here. We all have places to go and things to do. So you need to get back in line. Um, so, 
And again, in the greater scheme of things, are these really important? No, but when you're coming you know, to a community with a very critical eye, where it could only take one thing to like turn you off, those are generally you know, the things that will, you know, or if I can just share for a moment one of my personal pet peeves, the shoes. I don't know why people take their shoes off and leave them right in front of the door. Like, how are people expected to then walk through the door if it's completely covered in shoes? Just take your shoes off and move them to the side a little bit. And again, I've seen this. I've seen this with my husband's family. I mean, it's clearly a cultural thing. And again, I've decided it's my lot in life to then bend over and move all the shoes so that people can actually get through the door. So, you know, inshallah, I'll be rewarded for it. But, and again, it sounds kind of silly, but that just drives me out of my mind. <laughs> We here at the Masjid share your sentiments on the okay. shoes. As you can see, we have shoe rags. It's an ongoing battle. We have a brother with a question. Okay. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, I'm Sista. Um, with the understanding that you've gotten so far from, let me say from the time you, you become a Muslim, and with your Christianity background, I mean, the knowledge that you've gotten so far, um, have you ever compared, I mean, the teaching of these two religions and happen to high mark any, I mean, teaching or any point in the two religions that had really moved you in your mind to confirm within yourself that well, Islam is really a true religion. Um, so I remember years ago, I can't even remember how long ago, but it was before, I'm pretty sure it was before I took my Shahada, or maybe right around that time. Um, there was a Muslim woman who had done a a documentary on Hajj, and I think it was like the first time, I think it, it was done at National Geographic, and it was like the first time cameras were allowed inside. And she followed three different Muslims on their first Hajj. Um, one was uh, a Nigerian brother, and one was an Indonesian brother, and then one was a sister, um, actually an Irish-American sister who uh, was in Texas. And my husband and I had gone to National Geographic um, to see the the video, and um, and the Irish American sister was there to kind of talk about her experience, and um, and I remember, and I can't remember if, if it was what she actually said or if it was on the video, but she talked about how she just she kind of knew that this was um, like it just tied everything up so nicely, answered all the questions that she had had. Um, and, and so while I can't give you specific examples, um, other than like, you know, again, the Trinity, um, you know, original sin, the whole idea of Jesus dying so that, you know, our sins, which aren't really our sins, they were sins from somebody a long time ago, but we've all been paying the price for a very long time. Um, you know, and the Pope and all of those, that, you know, all of those questions that I had were just answered, um, you know, through Islam and, and, and the Quran. And, and when I knew it was right was that it kind of completed and finished off what was missing and it didn't negate anything that I had taken um, positively from Christianity, which, by the way, uh, some Christians don't believe that Catholics are Christians, so I just thought I'd point that out. <laughs> they always like to specify Christians and Catholics. Catholics are different because they have like all the saints and the statues and they do weird things with Mary. And, um, and so that's the other thing. I mean, even Mary, you know, subhanAllah, in Islam, she is so revered. Um, and that's something that Catholics definitely, to an unhealthy extent, um, you know, they, they, um, you know, they pray to Mary. Mary's very big in Catholicism. 
So I wouldn't say I've done a study, um, a comparative analysis on the two, um, but just, you know, as I learned and read, it, it just completed, it filled in all the missing parts for me. And, uh, and it made me feel as though, again, I wasn't dissing what I had come from, but I just moved to the next level. You know, I'd, I'd stepped it up. I stepped up my game. Um, so. Assalamu alaikum, sister. I, I have two Salam. questions. Uh, the first question is, what's, after you became Muslim, what's the first uh, and most difficult worship that you uh, think it's heavy or difficult among the pillars of Islam? Especially that many Muslims who convert to Islam they have never practiced this before. Salah, Siyam, Zakah, Hajj, all this stuff that may be done daily like Salah, fasting every year uh, in the month of Ramadan. So which one is, is, is most difficult for you? Or it, it, it's always difficult for the people who were not born as Muslims. This is the first question. And the second question is uh, being American and uh, raised in this country, you know the rights of the citizens uh, better than any immigrant of us. I, I'm an immigrant myself. So how, how do you feel about Islam being attacked everywhere uh, and uh, Muslims are always under fire? How, how can you be vocal to uh, represent Islam in the uh, correct manner and image, inshallah? Okay, so let me um, answer the first question. Um, you know, I come from a, my dad was um, an opera singer and taught voice, you know, all that time at Catholic University. My mom majored in speech and drama. We grew up in like the theater. Um, and so I was very much a free spirit who um, really didn't want to be chained down with things like uh, routines and patterns. Um, <laughs> like I just wanted to go kind of where the wind took me. And, uh, and so, and, I, and I've even seen like, you know, how I struggle even at this point in my life with not having um, implemented those routines earlier. And how subhanAllah my husband is just so easily able to do those things. And so I would say for myself, the hardest struggle has been, um, you know, the, the five prayers. Just because, you know, for 30 some odd years, I didn't have, you know, you get up when you have to get up. Oh, do I have swim team this morning? No, great, I can sleep in. Or, um, you know, or in the middle of the day. Or especially when the time changes. Oh my gosh. when. when <laughs> When the time changes and all of a sudden you have like three salahs in like four hours, I mean, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm not good about watching the clock. I need, uh, I don't know what I need. Um, and, and so that, you know, that definitely is, um, it's a struggle. I don't, you know, I don't do it with as much ease as I hope I will attain at some point in my life. Um, and then the second question, which I have now completely forgot. <laughs> The second question was about the attacks on Islam everywhere oh. in the media and on media. Yes. And how yes. can you be vocal yes. and what you can do for that? How could I forget that question? So I remember like, <laughs> like the first 10 years that my husband and I were together, I used to always say to him, look, honey, what Islam needs? Again, because everything for me back then was like a, an intellectual approach to everything. I'm like, look, I got the answer for you, honey. This is what you need. You need a PR agency. We're going to develop a campaign right now because clearly people don't know what's going on and this is why they treat Muslims the way they do because they just don't understand. They don't have, you know, you're not presenting yourselves in the right manner. Um, I still kind of feel that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember there was an incident a number of years ago with, um, when was it? Anyway, there were, Muslims, one of, one of them was an imam who were in the airport. They were going to get on a plane and they were praying in, you know, the waiting area. Um, and there was this big, you know, they stopped them. And I thought to myself, wow, now when I was younger, first of all, I wanted to be a nun. Like the nuns were really amazing. Um, some of them, some of them were mean, but most of them were amazing. 
Um, but when you saw a nun, even to this day, people who, who see religious, you know, people in religious attire, they immediately feel safe and warm. And I think to myself, okay, this is an even greater caliber of person. You know, what is it that we're not communicating to people? Because you should feel that same safety and peace when you see somebody bending over to put their forehead to the ground, wherever it is. Um, so, and unfortunately, I think there's a lot of politics that, you know, colors people's perception. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have, you know, are not familiar with Islam. So, you know, I sometimes think if people were learning about Christianity during like the 60s and 50s and 40s in this country, they really wouldn't have a good opinion of it. Um, so, does that answer your question? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, yeah. sister. Uh, well, yeah, is the, if there is no sister that needs to speak before me, maybe I can ask my question. Any sister questions? Yes. That, um, salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, I was born Muslim and I'm still Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. But I, um, the question that the Imam gave the first one about uh, the things that makes you get out of Islam, convert and then revert. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, the thing that I saw through your life. It was, I think it was good that you stayed 13 years with your husband because getting married, marriage is a journey by itself. Mm -hmm. You got rid of that journey, you learned it, mm -hmm. and then you step to the other journey. The new Muslim that convert, non-Muslim that convert, some of them get married right away and they started two journeys, difficult journeys at the same time. And I was born a Muslim, and really marriage is not easy. Mm -hmm. Because you start, it's a new life. I felt like I was dead and I born again. And I was a Muslim. How about somebody who's just started a new way? Yeah. I think, um, I told you, I don't have a question, but the way you went 13 years is like when Islam came to Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 13 mm -hmm. years, they were learning who's Allah, what is Jannah, and what is not. Yeah. You learned about your husband, and he helped you into your second journey. Yeah. And I will, again, you know, growing up Catholic, you don't get divorced. Yeah. That's it. I mean, I remember the very first person in my family, this was my mom's cousin, who got divorced. The scandal. It, to this day, the scandal of that divorce. You could hate the person forever, but you may not divorce them. Because really, the institute of marriage is so much more than the players in, term, you know, in Catholicism. Um, however, I then come to Islam, where sometimes you see, and again, I know that it's, you know, it's permissible, um, but sometimes you see the opposite. You see people, you know, like going into marriage and then like, you know, four months later, mm, it's not working out. Well, yeah, of course it's not working out. Four months. I mean, when I think about my husband and I, 21 years, we maybe got to like, like a really cool role about a year ago. <laughs> For 20 years, we've been on like this, you know, roller coaster. So four months, yeah. Um, and so, and I don't know, again, in Catholicism, you've got like pre-Cana. Like before you even get married, you got to go hang out with the priest, spend a little time. They're going to be asking you all kinds of questions. What are your intentions? What are you going to do? You're going to baptize your kid. Um, and um, so, but um, yeah, they are. They're two very, very difficult journeys. Um, and to do them both at the same time is very challenging. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Alaikum salam. Um, if you can give us uh, three pointers for uh, uh, doing da'wah uh, outreach to uh, Catholic communities, what would they be? Thank you. Um, well, I think I would certainly highlight the, the, uh, the position of um, Maryam in Islam, because that is, again, for Catholics, Mary is very important. 
Um, and you know, there, were, there was a time in the Irish American community where every girl's name was Mary something. Every girl's name was Mary some. Mary Ann, Mary Pat, Mary Frances, Mary Kathleen, Mary whatever. Um, so that would be number one. Let's see. And and even the the reverence for, um, you know, it's interesting because I remember when the current pope um, was speaking to a group, and I can't even remember what the occasion was, but he, you know, brought up some obscure historic text where someone was speaking derogatory about you know the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and and I remember saying to my mom how offensive that was to me because here you have the Pope who's the head of the church, you know, disparaging a prophet of God, and I said if you took the most uneducated Muslim, they would not do that, and she said well you can't say that I said absolutely I can say that without a shadow of a doubt. I can tell you, not a single one. Um, anyway, I digress. OK, so um, medium would be one. Mm. You know, um, and it's hard. I've kind of you know, been out of the Catholic community for a while. And I know it's very different. I mean, you know, now you have what you call cafeteria Catholics. And that's where you can go with your tray down the cafeteria line and kind of take what you want. Like, oh, I kind of like this part of it, but um, yeah, no, I'm not liking that. You can keep that, you can keep that, I'll take this. So, you know, even Catholics today, I think, are being raised very differently than, than we were. Um, I, think, I, I think just in general, you know, Dawah, the best way to do it is just in that manner, like as a reminder, you know, explaining to people um, you know, not being overly aggressive, not trying to, you know, cram it down their throats. Because I will tell you that when I talk to somebody, I can tell when they, when they see what I'm saying is true. And oftentimes the, re the response is not one of, oh, that's lovely. It's usually one of like anger, uh, defensiveness, um, you know, people who are, oh, that's nice, or, you know, kind of apathetic, it hasn't really touched them yet. You know, it's the people who kind of become defensive, um, who know on a certain level that what you're saying is true. But again, it means that they have to do a lot of work. Um, and so challenging them isn't always the best course of action. I think just, you know, gently reminding people, being out there, talking about things, being open, um, but persistent. You know, you don't want to, to go away, but um, you also don't want to be in their face as well. So. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Wa alaikum salam. Um, inshallah, we will pray Isha at 7.30, so we'll take these questions. You can summarize the answers to these questions, because I have some other brothers that have other questions. Okay. One quick one I'd like to throw in here is, um, how do your children handle the, how do you handle holidays at your house with, your grand, with the grandparents? Uh, must be some, I mean, you do want them, they do see their grandparents, I, I'm sure, but how do you handle the holidays, the secular holidays, the Christian holidays, not the, necessarily the Muslim holidays, but... Uh, if you can summarize the questions, the answers, because we have other questions too, and we'd like to uh, stop by 7.30, inshallah. Um, okay, so holidays. Um, yeah, we're, we're usually separate on holidays, uh, religious holidays. Um, and like I said, you know, we're all a work in progress. It's something that, you know, my husband and I talk about every year, and every year we come up with a different answer. And, um, you know, I don't think that there's one right answer. My parents, you know, go to church every Sunday like they have for, you know, their entire lives. My siblings, um, I always tell them, I'm like, just make sure you warn me before you go to church because if there's a lightning bolt coming down, I don't want to be anywhere near it. Um, I can't remember the last time my siblings were in church. So again, you know, even when they celebrate religious holidays, it's not a religious holiday. It's just like the habit. Well, we've celebrated Christmas every year for my entire life, so we're going to celebrate it again. And um, 
So, um, so yeah, so usually my family celebrates it and, you know, the kids are off with my husband doing something else. So, um, and again, you know, you're, you're constantly navigating issues like this. Um, so, we just, we do our best. There's a question over here on the sister side. Salam alaikum. Um, like I have a question. Yeah, baby. Um, did you like try to um, conv like let your parents or your siblings um, convert to Islam and teach them something about the Quran or something? Yes, I did. I talked to them a lot, but I don't know. I guess they're not ready yet. So just I make du'a. That's it. Alaikum salam. Salam alaikum, sister. Alaikum salam. Um, usually, um, for new Muslims, um, the, pro the primary problem they usually have is uh, with their parents or their family. So, um, I I would like to know. Uh, how long did it take your family to uh, somehow accept you as a Muslim? And what strategies will you want to share with uh, the new Muslims? Uh, in, if you have been almost uh, completely accepted by your, by your family, what strategies did you Put, I mean, put to use that you can share with the new Muslims. Because, ah, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry, I, okay, uh, so I just, uh, I was not around when you answered it, so please, I just would like you to briefly just mention it, sorry. Okay, so if I understand correctly, so my parents never rejected me. Um, you know, growing up, again, I mentioned that my parents are teachers, and it was very common for um, other languages to be spoken in my house, for people from other countries to be in, in our home. So the whole idea of my husband was, as a matter of fact, when we got married, um, you know, they wanted to know if anybody had a problem, like between our two families, with the fact that, you know, I'm Irish American and my husband's Ethiopian. Um, but as they were asking, they're looking at me, and I'm like, okay, well, my family doesn't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, it's his family who has the problem with it. <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, my family had no issues. As I said, you know, they were, um, they weren't jumping for joy, um, but they were perfectly fine with my, you know, acceptance of Islam. Um, and so, I mean, we really haven't. Um, now, what advice would I give to other people? You know, my, my parents now, especially my dad, who's 85, he had his knee replaced two years ago, and, and soon, inshallah, he'll be coming to, to live with us. Um, and so when you look at the respect that's you know required of your parents in Islam, I mean, how could you not see the beauty of it? Um, even if you don't see anything else, who, as an 85-year-old, would not want to be cared for in this manner? Um, so... I uh, I don't know if I have any techniques other than again just you know trying to um, be the best Muslim that you you know that one can be um, and you know treat your parents in the way that that you've been you know taught through Quran and Sunnah and but but there's no tension or animosity I love my parents very much and they think I'm amazing. Assalamu alaikum, sis. Unless oh there's a God. sister who has a question, I'll wait until afterwards. If there's not, then I'll ask. Okay. Nope. Okay. Um, Assalamu alaikum, sis. I'm the light. I thought your story is very interesting, particularly related to being married to your husband for 13 years before taking shahada. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that has concerned me, and I've seen this, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen this a lot, and I've seen it a lot lately, um, in which brothers accept Islam. Um, and either they are already married 
and then their wife accepts Islam, or um, the brother accepts Islam, he's talking to a non-Muslim sister, she accepts Islam. But then, if the marriage doesn't work out, um, next thing you know, the, the, the sister is like, she's left the husband, and she leaves the dean too. Right. Um, I, how do you see this in, as di di differently in your life? And what recommendation would you give for si sisters who are um, who haven't accepted Islam but are married to Muslims or talking to Muslim brothers about the issue of getting married in the in the dean? Because I've seen situations also where it affects the children, where you know because they they, they break up, the sister leaves is Islam and looks to take the children out of Islam with her. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> You know, as I mentioned, if I had accepted Islam for my husband, it would have been immediately. Um, it was really important that it was for me. Um, and, you know, Allahu Alam, I mean, if people are, you know, I, I mean, clearly Allah has put a love in my heart for my husband that, inshallah, never ends. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're ultimately not the responsible parties for whether people stay together or not, but I think as an Ummah it's important, again, that we establish relationships. So, and I know sisters often struggle, as I did, because, you know, I mean, I got all kinds of freedoms. I'm not giving up anything. Um, you know, I don't need somebody telling me, you know, what I have to wear or when I have to get up or, um, but, but when you spend time in the Ummah, you see that, you know, for, for a little extra effort up front, that you benefit in ways you cannot even possibly imagine in the long run. And there is so much that I have gained just from the experience of being amongst the sisters, who I have to say are, um, they can never get the props that they truly deserve because they are the um, most humble and patient of people that I have ever met. Even when I walked around the school, I would meet people who, um, I just thought were so amazing, and, and they would often think, oh, no, I didn't do that well enough. And I thought, are you kidding? Like, <laughs> um, and, and so it's, it's just really important to be, you know, even, um, you know, people who I've known who were in similar situations, you know, they marry their husband, they convert, the marriage breaks up, and they might not necessarily say they're not Muslim anymore, um, but they're not practicing. And so much of that, when I see it, it happens in people who have not become part of the community. And when I say part of the community, that means that you are interacting with your Muslim sister or your Muslim brother on a daily basis. Daily. Um, it just, it has to happen. So. Assalamu alaikum, sister. This is inshallah the last question because we have to pray at 7.30, as you announced. The question is very simple and it may be a funny question, but uh, it, it came many times to the Imam about the dilemma of changing name after becoming a Muslim. So ha I noticed that you didn't change your name. So uh, how do you feel about changing the name? And if you uh, choose to change your uh, pre-Islamic name, what would be the name that you may choose? Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, like I, like I mentioned before, you know, there, were so, there are so many, well, all things about Islam are perfect, but it just worked out really well. You know, I was married before, and I did change my name, because that's what you were supposed to do. Um, and after that marriage ended, I decided I was never changing it, my last name, my, my name again. Um, and I don't, you know, see, I mean, Moira is Gaelic for Mary, for Medium. So there's no need to change it. It's it's a beautiful name. Um, and I'm not one on, again, it's one of those things that, um, you know, as I came in and I learned more and, you know, people were changing their names and I would often think to myself, okay, well, why are you changing your name? I mean, I have a very, very dear friend who, um, like myself, raised very Catholic, um, and she converted to Orthodox Judaism. Um, and so she changed her name um, because, you know, she wasn't as fully accepted in their community, you know, with her non, you know, Jewish name. Um, but, you know, I always question that. I'm like, why, why do I have to change my, like, there's nothing wrong with my name. It's not offensive. You know, it's a beautiful name. Um, so, so I would not change my name. <laughs>
Uh, salam alaikum. Uh, thank, thank you, Sister Mara. Uh, you did a great job. We appreciate exactly. you. I've known you and your family maybe, yes. what, 10 years? Yeah, yes. and your beautiful and, daughter. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we really do appreciate that. And, and we hope your presentation would inspire us to really do a good da'wah, um, to reach out to the uh, Catholic communities. And, and we have it taped. And so, inshallah, uh, many will see and learn from you. And inshallah, a lot of people will accept Islam through that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sisters, you can do your salats here on this side if you choose to. Uh, or you can go back if you like. They can pray here. There is enough space. And we will move the chairs and, and do what we need to do to make you comfortable, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. And I thank you both brothers for coming also and sisters. And we will have next month, next month we will have Imam Talib. Imam Talib is the Imam of the Masjid in, uh, in Capital Heights. Uh, he will be here. And then following that we will have a couple other brothers who will be presenting. So many of you know Imam Talib. Uh, and so inshallah we will see you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.